Well, don't just take it from me. Take it from Marcus Freeman. Notre Dame is one of the best defenses in the country, and that was on full display in the Jersey scrimmage on Saturday. More on that coming up in today's edition of Locked on Irish. You are Locked on Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on? Welcome into Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. How about that new intro, by the way? I love the new look and sound. So we're starting off today hot. Today is Tuesday, April 16th. And thank you for making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojak, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports. And as always, you can watch the show on YouTube or you can listen wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching along on YouTube, please take a second to like the video below and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to the pod, please rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Win or lose, just visit FanDuel.com. So it's locked on to get started. All right, it is good to be back, and we have a lot to talk about in today's episode. Notre Dame held their jersey scrimmage on Saturday, and if you don't know what it is, it's basically the most competitive practice in the entire spring session. Personally, I think it's more competitive and more revealing than the actual blue and gold game because the starters go up against the starters and they're out on the field longer. And don't get me wrong, the twos and threes certainly get some work as well. But the winner in this game, and and the winner is determined by a modified scoring system so that it balances out a little bit for the defense, the winner gets their choice of jersey color, and they pick the blue jerseys, and that's what they get for practices during next season. So, as I mentioned, the scoring system is made to sort of balance it out for the defense to actually score some points, but they might not have needed it in this one to actually win because the defense registered two pick sixes in the scrimmage, and that was just part of what was a really, really impressive day on that side of the ball. So today... I'm going to go over my biggest takeaways from the scrimmage and try to figure out what it all means because something I always try to remind myself whenever I'm analyzing a practice or a scrimmage or the blue and gold game, like anything when it's Notre Dame going up against Notre Dame, it can be looked at as a zero-sum game, right? Because if you praise the defense too much, some might interpret that as saying, oh, well, if the defense is playing this well, that means the offense might stink or the other way around. But I never really look at it as... Is it is that right? I basically think that it's never that definitive, but if one side is really good, that should at least help the other side of the ball to some degree, right? Because they're going up against better competition every day in practice. So you would think that, okay, well, if they're going up the best in practice, then that should make it things easier in the actual game. It's like when a baseball player is in the batter's box and they swing a weighted bat. It's more difficult to swing while they're practicing because the bat is heavier, but when they go up to the plate, the bat feels wi- uh, bat feels lighter, excuse me, and swinging at an actual pitch feels a little bit easier. So all that being said, and as I try to just always keep that in mind when I look at all of this stuff, the starting unit on one side of the ball at Notre Dame is clearly ahead of the other at this, uh, at this point, and that is the defense. They have clearly an advantage over the offense right now. And it should not be a surprise to anyone that the defense is performing this well in practice. On one hand, you just look at what they did last year. They were a top five defense in most statistical categories. They finished seventh in scoring defense, and they returned a lot of guys from that unit. They did lose five starters from that group, most notably at linebacker and J.D. Bertrand and Maris Leavow. They also lost Cam Hart as well, who was a really exceptional corner last year for Notre Dame and throughout his uh, career with the Irish. But they also returned six key starters, including Two of the best players in the entire team in Benjamin uh, Benjamin Morrison, although he is recovering from a shoulder injury and was not able to participate in the jersey scrimmage. And then you also have Xavier Watts, the Bronco Nagurski Award winner for the top defensive player in the country. He is back on this defense, and you have two of the best defensive tackles in the country in Howard Cross and Riley Mills. Plus, you have some key pieces Um And they added some key pieces in the transfer portal, like RJ Open. Uh, Rod Hurd is going to join the team after spring practice. And then there's a bunch of young players on defense who look poised to break out. So you have all that. And then you have to look at Al Golden and what he has done at Notre Dame. He's entering his third season as the Notre Dame defensive coordinator. Meanwhile, Mike Denbrock is barely been at Notre Dame for longer than three months. So when you think about all that and all that comes together, 
the defense is going to have an advantage over the offense. And in order for Notre Dame to achieve their goals this season, the defense is going to have to lead them there. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to need they're not going to need some help in the offense. They absolutely do. But this team and all the success they have is going to be built around their defense. And that's a good thing because the defense is really, really good. And after this practice, or after the scrimmage, I should say, Marcus Freeman said so. He said, this is going to be one of the best defenses in the country. Uh, and and I think that's great for the team, but it's also good for the offense. But it, it can be a struggle going up against this unit, in particular when you're going up against them in a scrimmage. And Xavier Watts and Jaden Mickey were the defensive players who had the pick sixes. Uh, Adon Schuler had an interception as well. Steve Angeli threw two of the interceptions, and Kenny Minchie threw one of those, uh, just for the record. But it's also to, uh, important to point out that with all of this analysis, Riley Leonard, Notre Dame's eventual starting quarterback, was not a participant. He was like kind of out there. He had his helmet on, and he was sort of shadowing plays from behind the line of scrimmage. So I give him a ton of credit for trying to be out there as much as possible. But he is not obviously going to be going full go in the scrimmage, and he's not going to play in the blue and gold game either. But there were several guys who I want to point out from the defensive side of the ball who really impressed in this scrimmage. Bubakor Traore was a force on the edge, and that is a big development for the Irish because they need that kind of edge rusher, someone who can just put their arm in the ground and just fire off the ball and make things really, really difficult for the opposing offensive tackles. And unfortunately for Charles Jagasaw, he struggled a little bit with Traore as well. I think Traore is one of those guys who, when he came into Notre Dame, he had all this raw talent but really needed some time to put it all together. I thought it would take him a little bit longer for that to actually happen, but it seems like he is going to be a force this year as well. He's still not going to be the starting Viper. That's going to be Jordan Botello, but I wouldn't be surprised if Traore ends up uh, putting up a sack number that's actually close to to Battelle, and maybe by the halfway point of the season, he starts getting a little bit more reps out there than Battelle. We'll see. But Junior Tui Alamaka, who hasn't really been talked about as much anymore, partially because of guys like uh, Buba Cortreori, he had an early sack on Steve Angeli, and Jalen Sneed continues to shine. Pete Sampson from The Athletic said it's the best performance he's ever seen by Sneed. And I said last week, and I was talking about guys who um, – We've been hearing things that they've been playing really well. Snead has been one of those guys. And we always knew he had the athletic ability and that he could rush the passer. But now it looks like he's putting his game, uh, he's putting it all together. And even if he's not like an every down linebacker in this unit, he's going to be out there a lot and he can do a lot of different things. And he's going to be a very valuable asset for Al Golden in this defense. And he shined again on Saturday. And that's really, really encouraging. The more we see... Uh, more, the more we see of that from him, I feel like the more confident everyone is going to be about what he could do for the Irish this season and beyond. Jane Osbury is another young linebacker who's been talked about a lot this spring. He looked on, uh, he looked good on Saturday, and Marcus Freeman said afterwards that he's going to be a guy that's going to be really hard to take off the field because he can just do so many different things for that defense. Drake Bowen is another young linebacker. He's probably going to be starting at Mike. He looked good. And then there's a couple other guys who are not necessarily young or inexperienced, but they're new to this team, and that is Jordan Clark. He stood out. Uh, he's the nickel from Arizona State who, admittedly, I wasn't too sure about when Notre Dame added him, especially when they added him so early in the transfer portal last cycle. His stats at Arizona State were not great, and there were, there were some reports that, oh, well, he wasn't playing – uh, or he's playing through an injury throughout the season, and um, he was really struggling with that. Also, you got to look at what Arizona State had on defense. He did not really have a ton of help around him. So the stats and all the figures, like his targets, uh, the amount of receiving yards he gave up, none of that looked great, but he has been a standout player for the Irish this fall. And they really need that because the nickel position is one of the most important positions on this Notre Dame defense, and they need a really productive player, someone who can live up to what Thomas Harper did last season and Tariq Bracey did the year before. If Jordan Clark is able to do that, that is another huge development for this uh, Irish defense. Riley Mills and Howard Cross, I mean, they did what they do. They they did exactly what you would expect them to do. They're one of the best defensive tackles in the country, and I, I thought they performed really well, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, on them because you kind of know what they're going to get or what you're going to get with them. And also, they're just not playing as much in spring practice because they don't need to, right? Like, 
you don't want to risk an injury with those guys. But they still did look good when they were out there. So when you look at all three levels of this Notre Dame defense, they are just so stacked. The defensive line is going to be a strength. We know that they're very experienced. They're grown-ass men across the board there. And they have some very good reserves like Jason Anye, um, Gabriel Rubio, who I'll talk more in segment three. Donovan Heinish is starting to emerge. And then on the edge, you've got... Uh, Botello and Oban, who are the starters, and then you've got Traore. Josh Burnham played pretty well. And Junior Tui Alamak is getting some reps up there as well. So it's a really deep group. They're really good. The linebackers are young, but they have a very effective veteran in Jack Kaiser who's going to lead the way, and they are just loaded with young talent. So feel really good about the linebackers as well. Yes, they're going to make some mistakes this year, but I'm really excited to see what they can do. And then on the back end, Xavier Watts kind of reminded everyone just how good he is with his pick six, and he basically was high-stepping the whole way. Jane Mickey continues to elevate his game. He had a pick six. Adon Schuler is improving, and the quarterbacks, cornerbacks outside of Morrison are excelling as well. So all really, really good things for the starting defense. And then as it pertains to the offense, look, the offensive line is going to be, it's, they're going to be struggling against this group. I mean, they're returning just one starter who started in every game last season. So they're breaking in some new guys. And I think that eventually it will pay off going up against this group every day in practice. They're going to be challenged every single day. But I think that's going to be better for them in the long run. And I still think that outside of the line, there's still plenty of really encouraging signs for the starting unit. Um, Unfortunately, Jane Thomas is out with a hamstring injury, but Jane Greathouse and Chris Mitchell have really performed well throughout spring practice, and they had another good day on Saturday. Cooper Flanagan and Eli Raritan both played really well at tight end while Notre Dame waits on Mitchell Evans to recover from his ACL. It's good that guys like Raritan and Flanagan are stepping up. And I feel like... Um, the wide receiver room is deep. The running back room we know is loaded. Guys like Jeremiah Love and Jadarian Price, even though they're not able to break off big runs on this Notre Dame defense because they're just that talented. Jeremiah Love had one of the best plays of the entire scrimmage when he ran over Adon Schuler. Normally, when you think of Jeremiah Love, you think of a speed back, but man, he really laid the wood to Adon Schuler. And it's just like, man, what you get really excited about what his potential can be. So you take all that into consideration, and then you also take into account the fact that Notre Dame is still learning a lot under Mike Denbrock. I made the joke that he's only been around a couple months, but they're learning an entirely new system, much more advanced passing concepts. The terminology is going to be different going from Jared Parker to Mike Denbrock. So they're going to get there. It's going to take some time. I'm not saying this offense is going to be weak, but it's going to be a struggle when you're going up against one of the top defenses in the country every single day in practice, and we saw that on Saturday in the Jersey scrimmage. But... You know who might have been the most impressive player on offense? That would be early enrollee quarterback C.J. Carr, a name who you might have heard before. Why his performance on Saturday could shake up the entire quarterback room coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all in an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Today's episode is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phones anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much you can do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. You can charge other players rent for your iconic properties. And you can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb that leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, let's talk about freshman quarterback CJ Carr. It is certainly someone who I've talked about a lot on this podcast already. And whenever I've talked about him, I feel like I've always sort of been a little bit cautious with my praise for him and any sort of certainty that he's going to be great at Notre Dame. Now, don't get me wrong. I I was very excited about him when he committed to Notre Dame. 
He's a highly rated recruit. I loved what he did in high school in Michigan. I loved what he did with his recruiting class and how he basically acted as a leader for the group and spent so much time and effort trying to get other guys to commit. I love that about him. I loved everything that he said about Notre Dame. And I also love the fact that he's a Michigan kid. He's the grandson of Lloyd Carr. And then he picked Notre Dame over the Wolverines. There are so many things to like about CJ Carr from his game to his personality to invest to his investment into Notre Dame. But I've just always been a little bit cautious to say, okay, well, he's going to be great uh, when he's in college and he's going to be a great quarterback at Notre Dame. Then on Saturday, in his first real competitive outing uh, in the blue and gold, he goes out there and he was the most impressive quarterback on the field. Again, Riley Leonard wasn't out there, so he's basically competing against Steve Angeli and Kenny Minchie. But when you compare the three of them, C.J. Carr played the best. And in fairness to the other guys, C.J. Carr was never going up against the starting defense. Whenever C.J. Carr was out there, he started off with the threes and then he moved up to the twos. But still, what he did on Saturday was really, really impressive. And he also never went up with the starting offense. He was always working with the backups. He was working with the second or third team offensive line. And he had walk-on receivers out there at some point. But it didn't matter. He was out there, and he was still making plays. He had the best pass of the day on a post to Cam Williams that went for a touchdown that looked so good. Like, I've watched the clip that Notre Dame football put out of that play, and they, they put out, you know, a big compilation of a bunch of plays, but they really focused in on that one. And the ball just looked so pretty coming out of his hand. It's a beautiful spiral. His throwing motion is just, it's got such a great aesthetic, and it's just so refreshing to watch a young Notre Dame quarterback make a throw and be like, wow. That looked really good out of his hand. You're not trying to, like, convince yourself, oh, well, just make it a couple tweaks to his mechanics or, oh, this is going to get better down the line. Like, it's way more enjoyable when you don't have to make excuses for the young quarterback, especially the ones who came in as highly touted as C.J. Carr. But, unfortunately, that has been a reality for Notre Dame fans for the past, I don't know, decade, seemingly. That's probably a stretch. But you get my point. A lot of the young guys who came into Notre Dame who had a ton of high hopes, it just didn't look as good early on, especially not as good as it looks right now with CJ Carr. Like, do you remember the Phil Dracovic spring game? That was still to this day, one of the more bizarre performances I've ever seen, because, you know, for as much as Phil Dracovic has sort of fallen from grace, especially in the eyes of Notre Dame fans, like how he was looked at when he committed to Notre Dame and all the hype around him that he had. And then he goes out there in a spring game and it literally looked like he had never thrown a pass before that he had never even played a single snap as a quarterback. Like it was so gross and it made you think, wow, what the hell is going on there? And then he did actually kind of work things out a little bit uh, when he went to Boston college and then he went to Pitt and was terrible. And then unfortunately Notre Dame didn't even get to have uh, the revenge in that game this season. But My point is that C.J. Carr, you're not making excuses for him. He came out, and he looked awesome in that game. But it wasn't just his touchdown pass to Cam Williams. He had another play where he was pressured, rolled to his left, pointed down the field. I think it was to Jack Polian, who's a walk-on, and basically pointed at him, said, come back to me, and then made a nice throw. Again, rolling to his offhand and throws it down the field for a first down. Great pass on the sideline, and it was all on third down. Like, that is just a really difficult play to make for a quarterback of uh, at any level, really. And he's doing this uh, with the second and third team unit, and I just thought that was so impressive because it shows not only that he has raw talent, right, but he has the ability and just the innate leadership to sort of like have – complete control of the field where he's running left, he's feeling pressure, but he's not afraid and he's still got his eyes downfield and he's ready to make a play at any moment. So when you look at all this and you think about what CJ Carr was doing and you consider the fact that he was going up against the backups on defense for most of it, I don't want to overreact, but I also look at it and think, man, what else could CJ Carr have been doing in the practices where the media was not able to watch? Because I don't think that C.J. Carr is going to start for Notre Dame this year, nor should he. Um, But it reminds me of what happened last year in the Jersey scrimmage because throughout much of spring practice, or at least the early portions of spring practice last year, there was a legitimate competition, so to speak, between Sam Hartman and Tyler Buckner. Tyler Buckner was actually outperforming Sam Hartman in the early parts of that practice while Hartman was still learning the offense and kind of learning how to be a quarterback that goes under center and works in, you know, 12 and sometimes 13 personnel as opposed to running the slow mesh at Wake Forest. So 
Tyler Buckner had the upper hand early. And then in the Jersey scrimmage last year, even though the media wasn't able to see the full extent of it like they were this year, Sam Hartman basically cemented himself as the quarterback in that game. And then he eliminated any doubt in the blue and gold game a week later. I'm not saying that CJ Carr is about to do that uh, as the starting quarterback at Notre Dame this year. But it does make me think if he goes out there on Saturday in the blue and gold game and he shines again while all the other quarterbacks struggle, I think it changes the dynamic for the other quarterbacks in that room. Like, Steve Angeli is not going to be worried that much about C.J. Carr beating him out this year because Angeli is just way more experienced. He's so far ahead of him in the offense. And even though I think C.J. Carr is more natural talent than him, Angeli just has such a head start in him right now. And I think Angeli is a good enough player that he is going to beat out C.J. Carr this year. But Steve Angeli also has to worry about beating out Riley Leonard. And that seems increasingly unlikely, especially after he threw two interceptions in this jersey scrimmage. So he's going to have a decision to make after spring practice. Does he want to stay and most likely be the backup this year to Riley Leonard, or does he want to leave? That leaves Kenny Minchie in a weird spot because his decision is probably a little bit dependent on what Angeli decides to do. So if Angeli leaves, then Kenny Minchie is presumably the backup. But there is also chance a chance that C.J. Carr could play well enough to take over the backup spot at some point during this season, which is not really something... I anticipated before the start of spring practice. I or spring practice, I should say. Excuse me. I said earlier uh, before spring practice started that I thought that there was a good chance that Kenny Minchie would be the starting quarterback next year. But you know, if CJ Carr is playing this well and he continues to improve and he continues to shine, then that's going to put Kenny Minchie in a weird spot. So. For the record, you know, I, I want to make this clear. I am very high on Minchie still. I love that he's all football all the time. I love his throwing motion. I love his aggressiveness. But this is kind of what happens when you recruit the quarterback position really well every single year. That means that talented players might not have a chance to make it on the field because there is only one quarterback on the field at a time. So I'm not saying that Kenny Minchie is going to leave because of this one scrimmage either. And I think that there's also a, a real possibility that there's been several other practices where the media hasn't been able to watch, and Kenny Minchie could absolutely have been outperforming C.J. Carr in those practices. But what we saw from C.J. Carr in that scrimmage, I think, is really, really encouraging because Carr looked special. And there's been a lot of talk for the past couple of years that he could be special. And if he really is, if he's going to be that kind of player, and we're starting to see the signs of that this early on, it's going to be really hard to keep him off the field, and that is going to affect every single other quarterback in that room not named Riley Leonard because C.J. Carr is not going to beat out Riley Leonard this year, and Riley Leonard is only going to be around for this one year. I hope all the quarterbacks stay. I really do. I think that quarterback room is loaded with talent. I think that every single one of those guys is going to be a Power 5 starter at some point. Maybe not right now, but I think Angeli could probably do it, and Riley Leonard obviously can, and I think the future is really bright for Kenny Minchie and C.J. Carr. But Notre Dame needs a special talent at quarterback to take them where they want to go and where they haven't gone in a really long time. As C.J. Carr is starting to show that he just might be the guy that we always hoped he could be and we always hoped he could be special. And right now, it's looking like that's sort of the trajectory that he's on. Again, it's one scrimmage. I don't want to overreact to it, but just seeing the, this kind of... Um, these kinds of signs this early on in his career, and you're starting to hear all the other things about him, the future looks really bright for him, and I think that he has the chance to be that special quarterback that Notre Dame has desperately missed over the past decade plus. All right, coming up next, a few more thoughts in the Jersey scrimmage, and prepare yourself, folks, because the transfer portal window is here. Today's episode is also sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why I have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs is the tool to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Speaking from my own experience, I know that whenever we're looking to make a hire, we use LinkedIn to help find the perfect new team member, and it's so easy because they do the heavy lifting. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They've got a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get qualified candidates within 24 hours. It's why owners rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Post a job for free at LinkedIn.com slash college. That's LinkedIn.com. So it's locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
Tune in to Locked On's NFL Mock Draft live on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern, streaming on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Find the ultimate six-episode series on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts and a fantasy football angle as well. Remember, catch the Locked On NFL Mock Draft on April 17th at 7 o'clock Eastern, streaming live in the Locked On Sports Today, 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Okay, a couple more things before we go here. Gabriel Rubio was in attendance for the scrimmage on Saturday, and that is another really encouraging sign for the Irish. As we've talked about before on this podcast, he stepped away from the team and the university in January. Don't really have a ton of insight into his reasons why, but he has been a regular uh, figure at Notre Dame spring practice session so far. He's always been in shorts and a t-shirt, of course, because he's not able to participate. But I think it's really, really encouraging that he's been around as much as he has been because Marcus Freeman said he expects to have Rubio back in the summer. And Notre Dame really needs him because even though Gabriel Rubio is not going to start uh, on this defensive line because he's behind Howard Cross and Riley Mills, he is going to be a very important piece on that line as the number one reserve on the interior. And I like who Notre Dame has on the interior right now behind him. Um, but if they have Anya and Rubio, and then plus you got Donovan Heinish right there emerging as well, a young player with a really bright future, that is a really Really strong unit, and I feel really good about that. So it's good to see him there in practice. I mentioned Riley Leonard. He's been sort of participating with his helmet on and trying to get out there on the field as much as he possibly can as he recovers from his uh, from his second ankle surgery. But one unfortunate bit of news is that Tyson Ford has stepped away from the team for personal reasons. He was not in attendance for the scrimmage on Saturday. Marcus Freeman said that he's got some stuff to figure out. Um, I really hope that whatever Tyson Ford is dealing with, I, I wish nothing but the best for him. I've said before that I'm not really sure what his place is on the roster, just seeing so many young defensive tackles him on the depth chart. And it's unfortunate you know, because Tyson Ford came into Notre Dame with a lot of potential. Marcus Freeman basically had to pry him away from Oklahoma. And so far, it just hasn't really worked out for him. But I hope that whatever he decides to do, I hope he's able to get his degree from Notre Dame. And if he ends up transferring somewhere else, I, I wish the best for him. But that leads me to the transfer portal because the transfer portal, the spring cycle is open. Things are about to get crazy in college football. And as it stands, Notre Dame has 89 scholarship players on its roster. They are not going to have 89 scholarship players on their roster in a couple of weeks because they are not legally allowed to do that. That number, that limit is 85 guys. So guys are going to leave. And if they don't leave. Marcus Freeman is going to have to have some difficult conversations with guys who are, quite frankly, on the bottom of that 85-man roster. He's not going to cut them. That doesn't mean that they're going to have to uh, leave Notre Dame, but there's a chance that guys lose their football scholarship and they can still finish uh, the. They can finish out their time at the university and get their degree, but they will not have a scholarship on the football team. And I know that there's a lot of rumors going around across the college football landscape that it's about to be extra crazy this cycle. I believe that's true to an extent, and I also believe that it will impact Notre Dame to some degree. I don't think we're going to see a mass exodus or anything like that, but there are going to be some guys on this roster who you probably don't want to leave um, but they probably will. There's going to be a couple backups. You're like, oh, man, I was a little bit excited about their future, but they end up leaving. But I would say that in the vast majority of these cases, guys who enter their name in the spring transfer portal, they see the writing on the wall. They know that it's going to be difficult for them to get playing time, and they decide to look elsewhere. That is attrition. That is just part of what every team deals with nowadays in college football. But it would also not surprise me if one important guy on the roster – leaves. And I'm not reporting anything. I have no intel about any players uh, who are starters or who figure to be important pieces on this year's roster. I've not heard anything about a specific player looking to leave. I'm just looking at what modern college football is like these days and guys leave, right? 
the portal giveth, the portal taketh away. And Notre Dame could still add guys over the course of these next couple of weeks as well, even if they end up losing um, a starter or two, someone who you don't want to leave. Because last year, if you told me that Tyler Buckner would end up at Alabama and Logan Diggs would end up at LSU before spring practice, I'm guessing you would be pretty surprised. And that's exactly what happened. So we're going to see what happens. I'll, all I'm saying here is brace yourself because it's going to get real chaotic in college football here soon. And it's important to not overreact because – Remember things, remember how things felt after the first, or at least after the first week of the transfer portal at the end of the 2023 regular season? Like, remember when all those wide receivers left, there were people out there calling it catastrophic and the Notre Dame roster was in complete disarray? Well, how does that receiver room look now? It's in a lot better shape today than it was at the time, than a week before all of those guys decided to enter the transfer portal. So it's important to be patient. It's important to let things play out and not just overreact when one guy makes a move that you didn't want that player to make. Or if it's a couple guys, we're going to see what's going to happen. But I just think it's important to sit back, relax, enjoy this last week of spring practice before chaos ensues around college football. But trust that the guys on this team, the real important players on this roster, want to be part of something special this year because that is exactly what I think this Notre Dame team had accomplished. Um, and even if one guy or two guys leaves or however many guys decide to leave, I still think that this team is poised to make a run at the college football playoff and potentially win a couple games in the playoff as well. Really excited about what this team can do this season. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making Locked on Irish your first listener of the day. I'm going to be back every morning the rest of the week, starting tomorrow with Luke Smith. He's going to be back on the show to talk more about the Jersey scrimmage, other spring practice storylines, the transfer portal, all that good all that good stuff. Plus, we're going to preview the Blue and Gold game a little bit that's coming up on Saturday. In the meantime, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.